Hey. Thank you, brother. That is a beautiful way to put that, David. A beautiful slice of bread. Yes, it's, it's toasted. <laughs> Joan just doesn't get enough of that. We had to stop by the store and buy a whole loaf today. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted just a little bit more than one slice. But uh, I'll tell you, we get a whole loaf when we come here on Thursday night, don't we? Yeah. I was reminded of that today at uh, Janelle's service, how blessed we are just to know you. You all are just precious to us. That's right. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this privilege of coming in and worshiping with you. We are one body, aren't we? We're just one body. We all belong to the same team. I love that. Let's pray right now for Janelle's family. Heavenly Father, thank you for Janelle and her testimony. Every member we have of her is really precious. It was really wonderful today to just hear people speak about her life and uh, how, what an influence she had on so many people, Father. Always a positive influence, always uh, willing to help people grow closer to Jesus Christ and encouraging people. What an encouragement she was to Joan and I and David and all of us here. I know many people have talked to me about how she, has, she prayed for them. And uh, she was a prayer warrior. She was always praying for her family. We pray for her family right now. Father, just ask you to bless them with peace and comfort. And uh, we're thankful. I think of Helen Mallow also and how they were good friends. And uh, her family members were there today as well. And we're just uh, rejoicing to know that Helen and Janelle are together now. And having a great time there in the presence of the Lord. What a great hope we have in Jesus Christ. We are all encouraged as we think about that. Thank you for giving us the Word of God that explains to us so clearly this great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 19 million bread makers in heaven. Oh, my land. Speaking about bread, now, Helen, yeah. Helen would make bread for the whole brokerage, isn't that right? <laughs> How many bread? I think she had six or six yeah. or eight bread makers. Mm, bread machines, yeah. She had all these bread machines in her, in her room, at least five. Yeah. Um, but uh, the people realized that was her ministry. Yeah. You know, every loaf of bread, she would put a track in it. Yeah. She wanted people to know that Jesus is the bread of life. That's right. That's right. She'd go out and drive around Geronimo with some bread. She said, I never went home, uh, but when I saw enough people to give the bread out, there were always people out there. She was just looking for someone to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. She, she loved that. So, yeah, what, what a neat thing. They're together. Isn't that great? Right. That's right. Precious. And, you know, Janelle, she hardly ever came here without a prayer request. She was a prayer warrior. She always was asking us to pray for Mike or Kathy or other members of her family. And so she was always praying when I'd go by and visit with her. She wanted to tell me all about each of the kids. She had pictures of, of her family members there in her, in her apartment. And really, really neat how much she loved her family. And she loved Calvary Baptist, too. Oh, yeah. She loved the people there at Calvary Baptist. A lot of great history. And you know, her son, well, her daughter married the preacher's son. So that gave her a special, the baggage. You know, Mike was... Uh, tell me about the manners. Oh, yeah, we got there, and there were all these huge banners that are probably taller than this ceiling. You know, four, four banners, four different banners hanging, and uh, huge banners, beautiful, beautiful banners. And they had things, yes, every color you can imagine. I thought, are they having vacation Bible school here? You know, it's something that you might think would be vacation Bible school, because I know this time of the year they probably wouldn't have vacation Bible school, but it's kind of unusual for a funeral. And so uh, they did mention the fact that those banners, Janelle helped make those banners. I don't know how long ago it was, but they wanted to put those in display to show that she had had a part in making those beautiful, beautiful banners. That was really neat. And they would have things like Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, different sorts of things on those banners up in the front. So wasn't that neat? Really, really special. Well... All of you are just very special to us and very special to the Lord. And I love the way you love one another. You pray for one another. I hear these uh, stories about how you tell me about how you, you support one another, pray for one another. That's what we're supposed to do. As believers, we're members of one body. Everything in the Bible is really about teamwork. Have you ever noticed that? It's all about teamwork. Even the Trinity. Everything one does, they all do. They don't ever work independently of one another. Uh, Jesus said, I do whatever the Father tells me to do. You know, the, the Trinity is the most beautiful example of teamwork. But then you see Jesus, he, he wanted some disciples, didn't he? He didn't just go out all by himself. He had disciples. He appointed disciples. 
He appointed the 12. He appointed the 70. And he sent them out two by two. So uh, there was teamwork. We're, we're all really part of a team, and we need to really take advantage of that and realize that we're all part of one team. There's only one team with, in Jesus Christ. One team, one body. Everybody that believes in Jesus Christ is a member of that same body. And you know what Paul said? Paul said, if Jesus Christ means anything to you, if there's any consolation in Christ, and that's what he said, but I, I told him, if Jesus Christ has done anything for you at all, if he means anything to you at all, seek unity. Be of one mind. Be, seek unity. Now that tells me that that was pretty important to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> that was pretty important. And I don't think he was saying we have to agree on everything. When he says be of one mind, he was saying set priorities. Look at what's most important and find unity in those things. He says there will always be differences of opinion about different things. That's okay. That's okay. God has different things for different people to do. There are differences in ministry that each of us are called to do. But find those areas of unity that we have and emphasize those unities. Realize, yes, if they believe in Jesus Christ, they're a member of the same team that I'm on. I'm on the same team. We're on the same body. And you know what? I, I guess other people have said it. I, the first person I heard that said it was John Maxwell. He says, the teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> if you want your dream to come true, you've got to be on a team. It's hard to accomplish anything. He said, one, it's just not a big enough number. <laughs> you need more than one. And so we have this wonderful teamwork that we, we're called to really value and appreciate and, and get into. Get into that team. Be part of the team. You can be part of the victory as well. That's what we're going to look at today as far as this great harvest. When Jesus talked about the harvest, he emphasized this teamwork. When he was, after he met the woman at the will, all these people from that town came out to visit with him. And he, he was just looking at the crowds and the people that were loving the word of God, loving Jesus. And he says, don't you, uh, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. He said, the harvest didn't weigh out there. The harvest is here. He says, don't be uh, overlooking what's right in front of you. The harvest is ready. What's he looking at? He says, these people, these people, they have what we have to offer. They want. They want what we have to offer. And why do they want it? Because they need it. <laughs> they need what we have to offer. And did you know the, the essence of what we have to offer people is peace and joy? Peace and joy is the fruit of salvation. Why? How do we get salvation? We believe in Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins. We accept Jesus Christ into our life. And what's the result? Peace and joy. That's what people need. That's what people want. Peace and joy. That's what draws us all together. When I say... You know, when Paul said, if there's any consolation in Christ, seek to be of the same mind, we have the same peace, don't we? We have that in common. We're experiencing that same peace. We're experiencing that same joy. It draws us together. We're all, we're all one team. We're on that peace. And it's a powerful peace. Like we studied last week about Paul said, uh, you know, if you rejoice in the Lord always, uh, present your uh, prayers to the Lord. He says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. It's a powerful peace. It's a powerful piece. It'll guard your heart. It's strong enough to direct you in your life. I've mentioned it before. David always tells me, follow your peace. Follow your peace. That peace is very, very real. If you go in the wrong direction, you're going to lose your peace. Did you know that? You'll lose that peace and you'll be able to sense it. You'll say, oh, that's, that's not the right. That God didn't want me to go there. You know, this is not for me. This is not what God wants. Follow your peace. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Really, in the same place where he talks about uh, hymns, songs and hymns and spiritual songs. He says, be together. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Sing songs. Praise the Lord together. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. So he says, the harvest is ready. Have you ever seen a, a cotton field that's ready for harvest? Yes. You know, they don't, uh, we don't have really good cotton harvest around here very often because we don't get enough rain in the summertime. Uh, in those critical times in the summer, so hot around here, it's hard to get a good cotton crop. But man, every once in a while, 
It'll rain just at the right time. Right. And you'll drive down the country roads and you'll see this whole field and the whole field is absolutely white, just like you see this, this picture right here. And that's a beautiful sight. I mean, for miles away, you'll look at that, that sloping hill and the whole thing is just perfectly white. I love to see that. And so Jesus is looking at these people and he says, the harvest is ready. We're, get excited about it. There's people out there that really are longing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're longing to hear what Jesus had to tell to this woman. He says, I'll give you living water. It'll be a well of water springing up in your life to everlasting life. It'll be, it'll be just an, it'll be an unending stream of peace and joy, water, everlasting life. It'll be a well of water springing up. He said, that's what people need. They're so hungry for it. They are so hungry for it. Uh, it's wonderful to know that we have what people need. I, that's what I pray for whenever we come here on Thursday night, whenever I preach on, Friday, on uh, Sunday morning. I just pray, Father, help us to give what people need. <laughs> you know what people need. And it's not just about learning. It's about many other things. You know, people. some people need learning, education, to be informed. Some people just need peace. They just need a sense of peace, a sense of direction. Whatever it is that people need, God says, yeah, He will supply our need. And as we minister, as we sing, as we preach, God is ministering. And it's a wonderful thing to know. God is ministering. God, meet the needs of the people. Meet the needs. The harvest is out there. It's ready. The Holy Spirit's ready to meet those needs. But look what He says. He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the harvest. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. <laughs> there's eternal life for himself. There's eternal life for everyone that receives it. He says this is a harvest of eternal life. It's not a harvest of wheat. It's not a harvest of cotton. It's a harvest of eternal life. Yes, they're going to reap a harvest of eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. What's he implying? It may be one person that sows, another person that reaps. That's okay. It's teamwork. Isn't that right? He says we all re are going to rejoice in this great harvest. He expands on that. He says, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. He says, that's, that's okay. You don't have to do everything. One person will uh, sow, another person will reap. He says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. He's talking to his disciples, telling him, this harvest is great and it's ready to be harvested, but you didn't even sow it. He says it's a beautiful thing. God has prepared this harvest for you. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. What is he talking about? Well, who is it that sowed this great harvest? Who is it that made this ready for the, the disciples to come in and reap the harvest? Well, I have to think that he's talking about this teamwork. We're going to get into who it was, but you know, this is something that Paul talked about too. It's diversity. Different people do different things. He said the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. Some people plant, some people water. Jesus said some people harvest. He says, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Where we work together, and we're rewarded individually. Isn't that right? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Everybody on the team gets a reward. Gets their reward according to their labor. So, but we all work on the same team. Paul, Paul is really emphasizing that unity with these people at Corinth. Because you know what? Some people were uh, getting off into different groups and saying, well, I'm really a follower of Apollos. In other words, say, I'm a follower of Paul. Others would say, I'm a follower of Christ. Did you notice he said, even those who said, I'm a follower of Christ were had a bad attitude because they were separating themselves from other people. They weren't striving for unity. He says, look, we're all on the same team. Different people are doing different things. We're all experiencing this wonderful peace and joy that comes as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It comes as a result of faith in Jesus Christ. He says, even those people that were saying, I'm of Christ, they did it with this attitude that says, well, we're better than these other people that say they're followers of Paul and others are followers of Apostle. He says, no, it's all on the same team. So Paul is really following up on what Jesus said. We have different things and seeking unity is very, very important. But Jesus said, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So who do you think that was? I just have to believe myself that he's talking about the Old Testament prophets. 
the Old Testament uh, people who sowed. Think about all those years. The, the New Testament really covers all the way from the beginning. Of course, uh, it was written uh, about 1,500 years before Jesus came. Uh, it was uh, what well, was about 4,000 years where Adam and Eve to the cross. 4,000 years from Adam and Eve to the cross. It's been 2,000 years since the cross, hasn't it? But uh, the Bible was written by Moses about, but it started with Moses around 1,500 years before Christ. So all these scriptures that you see in the Old Testament over that 1,500 year period were, were written by these different apostles and prophets. And what were they doing? They were sowing seeds. They were sowing seeds. I have to believe that Jesus must have been thinking about all the people that went before over these many hundreds of years, sowing seeds, writing the scriptures, teaching things that would bear fruit eventually. Much of what was written by them, the people didn't really understand. They couldn't have understood exactly what it was that they were talking about. But he says, we're ready to reap that harvest now because now we have this revelation of the truth of Jesus Christ. We, we now see what many of them were doing. Look at what uh, David said in Psalm 22. He said, Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Was David talking about himself? No. Couldn't have been. He was planting the seed, wasn't he? He was planting the seed that we are harvesting. They couldn't have really understood what he was talking about. They thought, well, he must have been talking figuratively, you know. I mean, he, it never happened to him personally, but no, he was talking about Jesus. He had a very, very clear vision of Jesus. He's planting the seed. All my bones are on display. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross? All of his bones on display. People stare and gloat over me. They're mocking him on the cross. Isn't that right? They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. How much more specific can you get? Planting seeds. Amazing. Planting these beautiful seeds. The Holy Spirit knows there's a great harvest coming. There's a great harvest coming. Somebody's got to plant the seeds. So... David was one of those. I mean, I could have just gone all night long talking about different passages where these Old Testament prophets were planting the seeds. But look at one more. This is beautiful. It's the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, isn't it? Where the Isaiah himself, 700 years before Christ, he says, he was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus, not a bone was broken, but he was pierced, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Not a bone was broken. He was crushed for our iniquities. Why was he on that cross? Isaiah says he was there for you and me. Isaiah knew it. Isaiah saw it. Isaiah was planting the seeds. Planting the seeds that would bear fruit 700 years later. The, the, the great theologians of the day could never explain this. They would argue about it and have discussions about what is he talking about? You know, they knew the glorious king that was coming, the Messiah, that's coming to save the world and, to, and bring about a great kingdom, but they couldn't understand the suffering Savior. What, what's that all about? Uh, but Isaiah understood it. Isaiah at least got a vision of it, and he, he's planting these seeds. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. I love that emphasis on peace. What did his punishment bring? Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. That's what we all have in common, those of us that follow Christ. We have this peace. He says he brought peace. Our, uh, it was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We have been healed. We have been healed through faith in Jesus Christ. We have been healed. We've been given this peace that brings healing to our soul. It's just, it's just something we marvel in. It's something we rejoice in. As we're singing praises, we're just thanking God for this beautiful peace that we have as a result of the cross of Jesus Christ. So, we're, Jesus says, the harvest is ready. I mean, now we understand all the things that the Old Testament prophets were talking about. We can see clearly the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, the Apostle John signed, uh, tells us at the very end about this ultimate harvest. He says, there's an ultimate harvest coming. He says, all of those through all the years who believed in Jesus Christ are going to be caught up in one team. It's all one team. Everybody on the team is going to get caught up. 
Everybody who belongs to Jesus Christ is going to get caught up in a great harvest. Now that's the ultimate harvest, isn't it? It says, when all believers are caught up to be with the Lord. And Revelation points it out. The book of Revelation, in Revelation 14, John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. He's ready to, for the harvest, isn't he? He's going to gather those who believe. He says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. Boy, that's a harvest Jesus is looking forward to. I know we are too. We're looking forward to it. Jesus is looking forward to it. There's a day coming when the trump will sound and the Lord will appear. Wow. He says, yes. He says, the angels are saying, do it. <laughs> do it. It's like they're, they're the cheerleaders, right? <laughs> do it, Lord. Thrust in your sickle. The time has come. It's time for the victory. This ultimate victory. Dressed in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. <laughs> There's a great harvest coming. The other side of the coin is, what about those who don't believe? Well, your heart goes out to people that don't believe. First of all, they don't have any means of peace. There's no way they can ever truly experience peace and joy. People who do not believe in Jesus cannot find peace and joy. And you know, one of the evidences of it is because they're looking for everything in the world to try to find joy. They're constantly looking for more. What can I do? What can I get? How can I get more to be, uh, to be all that I really need to be? They're just searching for more, grasping for more. Once you find that peace, you're satisfied. There's a satisfaction. There's a peace that says, ah, oh, it's just a contentment. Like Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I am. Wherever I am. If I'm in prison, I still have peace. You know, if I'm out on the uh, circuit preaching the gospel, I have peace. He says, what? whatever state I'm in, that's okay. I have peace. He says, I, I have that. Well, so we have that peace as believers, and we have this great hope of everlasting life. But he says, there's a large number of people that don't have that. There are a large number of people who do not know Jesus Christ. They are not experiencing that peace that God wants us to experience. And he says they will not be part of this great harvest. It's something to pray about, isn't it? It's something to pray about. Helen Mallow, she prayed about that. She said, I've got a plan to help people. I'm going to make this bread. I'm going to make this bread. I'm going to put a track in it. I'm going to go out there and reach as many people as I can. Because I want people to know Jesus Christ. Amen. There are people that are not going to be in this harvest. We need to pray for them. We need to look for ways. Jesus said the harvest is ready. <laughs> Go out and, and reach it. People are waiting for what we have to offer. And guess what John saw? There's the harvest of the unbelievers as well. Right here in the same chapter. John said, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is the other harvest, isn't it? This is the other team. People who don't know the Lord are on a team. Did you know that? They don't know it, but they're on a team. They're all on one team, and there's a, a, an ultimate destiny for those who don't know Jesus Christ. They won't be in the team that we're on. They're on the other team. He says there is a great harvest for them where they go into the wine press of the wrath of God. And John has a very clear vision of this future day this future day of, of great, the wrath of God being poured out upon those who don't believe. He says, And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. He says, This is the other harvest. 
And that's really the message that the Bible presents to people all the way through. Which team are you on? Which team are you on? You can be on the team that's harvested first and brought up to be with the Lord, given everlasting life. Or you can be on the team that's left behind and experiences the full wrath of God. There is a judgment coming. There is a day of judgment coming. And it's not like God wants to punish people. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's not like God just says, well, man, if you don't do what I say, I'm, I'm just looking forward to punishment. No, it's just the ultimate result of sin. It's the ultimate result of rejecting Jesus Christ. It's very much like uh, Timothy Keller said. Did you know that evil doesn't exist apart from righteousness? God established righteousness. He didn't establish evil. He established righteousness. Therefore, anything that opposes that is automatically evil by default. Do you see, see the difference? He didn't create it. It's just that anybody that doesn't go along with the righteousness that God established, that by, de by default is evil. Anything that opposes the righteousness of God. So there is this, God gives us free will. He didn't create evil, but He gave us free will. So He says, this is righteousness. Anybody that doesn't accept it and walk by that and receive it is automatically in that category of evil. This is the same way. It's not like uh, God is looking forward to punishing people. It's just that's the end result. If you don't accept Christ, this is the way, the, the end result of that. There's a harvest for those who simply refuse. And just think about how easy God has made it. God has made it so easy. Religion makes it kind of hard. Did you know that? <laughs> Religion in general makes it kind of hard. They, they come up with all kinds of rules that say, oh, you've got to do, you can't go to heaven unless you do this, unless you do that, do the other. There's all kinds of rules you've got to do to get to heaven. If they, if they don't come with rules, they come up with theological propositions that you have to agree with. You have to agree with this, and you have to agree with this, and you have to agree with this. If you don't agree with that, you're not going to be in the team. You know, there's all kinds of other conditions that people have, theological and practical behavior type things. Jesus said, no. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How easy is that? How easy is that? You know, if you had to do a lot of other stuff to be saved besides believe, don't you think Jesus might have told Nicodemus about it? That's a great story. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He says, we think you might be the Messiah. Jesus says you have to be born again if you want to go into the kingdom. Jesus knew what he was really getting at. He... Nicodemus knew about the kingdom. He wanted to be in that kingdom. And Jesus said, I know what you're talking about. He says, you, you're wanting to know who I am? He says, if you want to be in the kingdom, you've got to be born again. And so when Jesus talked about being born again, how do you get born again? By the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, you have to be born by the power of the Holy Spirit coming in. Did you know spirit means breath? Spirit simply means breath. Ruach is the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Numa in the New Testament, the word for spirit, and it's often translated wind or breath. Wind or breath. So when you receive the Spirit of God, you receive the breath of God. God blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And that breath is born again. That breath is full of joy. That breath of God is peace. You can't have it without the breath of God. So, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born of the pneuma, the wind. He said, the wind blows where it listeth, and you, and you hear the sound thereof, but you don't know where it's going or where it's coming from. He says, you can see the effect of the wind, of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God is moving around, and you know it's there. You just can't define it. But he says, that's the Spirit that saves you. It's the breath of God. He says, all you have to do is open your heart to receive it. Say, I want the breath of God. I want God to breathe into me the peace and the joy. He says, that's all it takes. And we know that because when Jesus got specific with Nicodemus, what did He say? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He did not say, whosoever believeth in Him and does this and does this and does this and whosoever believeth in Him and joins this and joins this. He could have put all kinds of other conditions on there, couldn't He? Here's Nicodemus wanting to know how to get born again. And
And Jesus says, believe. Just believe. If you believe, you'll be like everybody else who believes. You'll be on the same team with everybody else. You believe, you will not perish. You will not experience the wine press of the wrath of God. If you believe in Jesus Christ, He will breathe into your heart. He will breathe in the peace and the joy. And you will be saved. You will be saved. How simple is that? God wanted it to be simple. He wanted, but He also wanted it where you had to believe. You had to have faith. That's just the one key. And it's hard for people. Did you know that? It's hard for people to believe. People would sometimes rather say, oh, if I can just keep the, keep the Ten Commandments, I'll go to, that'll, that'll make me feel like I'm doing something. They don't want to believe. It's just faith. But that takes faith to believe. It's just faith. Did you know that? It, it takes faith to believe. It's just faith. It's not faith to say, well, I've got to keep the Ten Commandments too. Well, that's, that's not faith. Faith is saying, I believe what Jesus said. If I believe in Jesus Christ, He will breathe into me the peace and the joy, the everlasting life, the, the fountain that flows, an unending fountain of peace and joy that will never end. I believe that. I believe that. And you enter into this relationship with Christ and you're on the same team with everybody else that believes in Jesus Christ. We're all going up together one of these days. Praise the Lord. Oh, man, it is well with my soul. Isn't that right? That's the peace of God right there. When peace like a river flows into my soul, that's the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time tonight where we can just rejoice in the goodness of God. We can rejoice in the grace of Jesus Christ the mercy of Jesus Christ, His willingness to leave all of the glory of heaven simply because He loves us. He loves us so much. He's so forgiving, so full of mercy. We don't deserve the blessings that He gives to us. We don't deserve this, this great salvation, this peace, this joy. He gives it freely. He gives it freely to those who believe. Thank you, Father, for everybody here tonight. We've had a wonderful time together. We give you the praise and the glory for it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, James. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Yes, thank you. Is that me? I don't know. Might be. I won't do it. You know, a, a real smart friend of mine once said he was a preacher, been a preacher for 300 years, a long time. He said, David... Religion, religion always tells you you haven't done enough. Uh -huh. yeah. If it destroys your peace, it's you haven't done it. If I could, woulda, coulda, shoulda will kill us. I woulda, shoulda, woulda, coulda. And he's, I, I think about that religion. Religion means a return to bondage. If you go look it up, bondage. Jesus did not like re re religious people. The Pharisees he hated. Didn't like religion. If you want to be religious, come to Brookridge, minister to the widows and orphans. Oh, that's real because that's, James tells us that that's the true religion. That's the true religion. So bless you guys. You guys have a great week. And we just ask righteousness, peace, and joy throughout your, throughout your, throughout your bodies. And by the way, we are many. Though we are many, we are one body. We are one body. In Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. There's no insignificant part. Did you ever run through the house and stump your toe? Your little toe was very significant for just that few moments as you learn new words coming out of your mouth. <laughs> but little toes are part of the body. We're all part of the body. Everything is connected by Jesus. So be, be encouraged. Pray for America. Be encouraged. Pray for me. Pray for Jim, Joan, and pray for everybody in this place. Not just in this room, but in this place. Staff, people that live here. Okay? Amen. Yes, thank you. That's great encouragement, David. Thank you. Just, people here at Brookridge need the peace of God, don't they? We do need the peace of God, don't we? We need the peace of God. And we're going to sing this little song. I can see Phyllis, Billy Gilliland, uh -huh. and Mary. Mary. Mary Jo. Mary Jo, right here, sitting right here. Yeah. They would hold hands, oh, yeah. huggle, snuggle up. And, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, 
Good evening, everybody. Y'all have a great week. Amen. Amen. Amen.